So as you guys know, I love Dr. Kirk Honda and his work, specifically Love is Blind stuff. I don't watch his other stuff. Sorry, Dr. Kirk. I just watch his Love is Blind stuff. I just love it so much. In this video, though, he's he's going over Teal Swan, which you guys know. I only realized who Teal Swan was because everybody kept sending me her videos. And they're like, is this like your level system? No, it's not. I am not a fan of Teal Swan. I don't think she's very healthy, happy, or kind. I think she has helped some people, and I think that's great. But I don't think she comes from the healthiest place, and it makes me very nervous. I watched her Hulu series. I've watched her channel. We've dissected it on the Discord. We've had discussions about it in my audience. So we're well aware of her work. But I didn't realize that Dr. Kirk had his own little series on her. So let's go ahead and watch that together. My name is Dr. Kirk Honda. I'm a therapist and a professor. As always, if you or you know someone who might be thinking about suicide or at risk of suicide, finding ongoing treatment is extremely helpful with a specialist and contacting the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline. You can just Google that, find it, contact them. You deserve it. Let's watch. There's been a lot of confusion and misconception about my stance on suicide. Most specifically, what my stance is and why. For that reason, I'm hoping to make this video so as to clear up any confusion. So just from the onset, I want to say that I have watched the documentary on Hulu called mm -hmm. The Deep End. I've mm -hmm. listened to the podcast called The Gateway by Jennings Brown that was published a few years ago. And I've watched some other materials as well. So I'm not coming into this without knowing much information. And one thing that we know from her is that she is not a licensed clinician. She has no formal education in any mental health field or any kind of suicide prevention protocol. So if you don't know anything about her, she is a self-help guru. Instead of giving you a speech about it, I'm just going to highlight some points. To be crystal clear, I'm against suicide. When you're feeling depressed, when you're feeling panicked, when you're feeling powerless, suicide is not the answer. Okay, good. So I think that's consistent with other things that she said, but if you don't know, there's a lot of people attacking her, accusing her of encouraging people to kill themselves. Not because she wants people to die, but because her method of trying to help people who are thinking about suicide seems to suggest that, particularly if you cherry pick certain aspects of her approach, and she has been attacked in this way. So she is saying, to be crystal clear, I'm mm -hmm. against suicide. I don't want people to do that. I'm, I'm glad that she says that. My ultimate goal is to help people who are feeling suicidal to get back in touch with a feeling that their life is worth living for. This is the ultimate reason why I even did a video addressing the topic of suicide, trying to help people who are currently feeling suicidal. Okay, good, yeah. That is often a method of helping people get through temporary moments of increased suicidal intent. And mm -hmm. that needs to be clear as well. There's a myth that I actually used to believe that people who think about suicide, they're basically doomed and you might be able to stop them for a little bit, but eventually they'll be able to do that because you can't watch them 24-7. Mm -hmm. And that is a huge myth. People have spikes of intent that last for an hour or a couple days. Usually it's just for a couple days. And if we get people through that, which I and many other clinicians, and I suppose maybe Teal Swan as well has, then after the intense motivation subsides, the individual will thank us for getting them through that time. So it's very important that not only we help people get through that time, but also that people who have thoughts about that have a system in place where they can manage to get through that time. It often involves being with other people. Hospitalization might be helpful, but sometimes we don't need that level mm -hmm. of treatment. It can be a monitoring system by family and friends. So, okay, I, I will say that I, I've been trying to practice how I talk about like suicide versus like chosen death. And um, the differences of how we risk our lives, right? We risk our lives in a lot of ways. Some people have tough jobs. Some people drink. Some people smoke. Some people call smoking a slow suicide, right? Like if you know you're going to – it's going to kill you, like why are you doing it? And we in society tolerate um, slow suicide if you want to call it that. I would just call it like – you only live once, right? And so for some people, like, what does it mean? Now, I think, again, it goes down to why are you smoking? Are you smoking because, like, you're addicted and you enjoy it? You're not actually trying to kill yourself? Well, then that's not really suicide. But if you're smoking 30 cigarettes a day or 40 or 50 or 60 in the hopes that it will give you lung cancer so you can die from cancer without pulling the trigger, then I would call that a slow suicide. So for me, I'm trying to be, like, self-aware of even the nuance between 
like self-harm, suicide, intentionality, enjoyment of things that happen to be bad for you. Look, I love me hot Cheetos. I almost cried the other day seeing a picture of one. I was like, oh my God, girl, I need some hot Cheetos. But at the same time, do I know they're bad for me? Yes. But I think it's worth the harm of eating hot Cheetos, frankly. But for some people, it's not. For some people, like I remember when the doctors thought I had maybe lupus and I was eating hot Cheetos still. My parents were like, you don't care about getting better if you're still eating hot Cheetos. And I was like, maybe that's true, but I really like hot Cheetos, bro. So that's something to consider in terms of the nuance, I suppose. And then I realized too, um, that for me, all I needed was like a support system or myself. I think I just needed to be able to say out loud, Hey, I, I want to own a life myself. I want to self harm. And I think people trusting me to get through it really helped me get through it as well. Like, hey, I believe in you and I'll see you when you're done like going through it, okay? But like call me if you need anything was like the best support I ever got from the people around me. People who over panic really give me anxiety. It's why I try not to do it now when people present like really intense ideas to me. I try not to overreact um, when they're coming and confiding in me because again, I I feel like that was the worst way for people to overreact to me. I hate, I don't like overreactors. It feels like fearful and fear is the root of all evil. And so I don't want people to overreact to me. And sometimes I think like normal society, we saw this on the death panels with Wick. I feel like Wick is well, really well intentioned, but sometimes his like expression of like worry gives me like paranoid vibes and I don't like paranoid people. So when he says like, I want to save you, I need to like put you in a hospital. It's very like, you're more dangerous than the suicide. You are the reason people want to die because they already feel suffocated and trapped. And so when you entrap them again, it's like people who throw you in conversion camp. Like, how do you think that's not going to cause someone to want to die even more? It's like when you trap people and suffocate them instead of like actually telling them, hey, I trust you and I'm going to help you at the same time. It's like Britney Spears. People will literally write to me and say like, I, I care about Britney Spears because I want her to get help. Someone should should like put her in a hospital. Don't you see that you're not helping her? Right? Like everyone thinks they know how to help people by trapping people. And I'm like, that's so ironic. You want to trap people that want to die. What do you think they want to die? What do you think they're doing? They're escaping. Why are they escaping life? Why are you trying to put them in a cage? And then of course, there are some people that would benefit from hospitalization and some people that benefit from meds and some people that benefit from what I perceive to be a trap. So be careful what you think you're doing in terms of help because the road to hell is paved in good intentions. Friends overseen by a team of clinicians or even one clinician, maybe an increase in sessions, this kind of thing. And safety planning regarding suicide is very complex. I've done a whole deep dive on that. You can list patrons can listen to that, and maybe we'll get into that. Given that this is a very and I just want to say I got therapy in Seattle. The first therapist I had could not deal with my suicidal um, ideations. Like she, it freaked her out. She's like, I need you on meds. I'm not going to see you again unless you get on meds. And I was like, that's a really weird request. I'm not like adhering to that request. I'll find a better therapist. I found the next therapist who was the most amazing therapist in the whole world. Found her, did DBT with her. I told her right away about the suicidal ideations. I told her the same thing I told the previous therapist. Um, I told her I'm open to medication, but I'd prefer 10 sessions before we go to meds just because I'd like to have like a rapport with you and not feel like you're just popping pills at me unless you feel like they're for a very specific reason. And um, I talked to her often about like unaliving myself and she put me on a watch. And so I had like a nurse check in with me once a week just to make sure I was alive. But I was very high functioning borderline. So they were like, look, you made it this far. You're maintaining jobs. You go to work. You work with children. You're obviously like you just need some regulation with your emotions. It's like, okay. And they were right. Like she made the absolute right call with me. She made me feel so seen and humanized. She did the, she made the exact right call. DBT, weekly check-ins with a nurse and like just making sure that I'm like encouraged and like reminded that like, look how functional you already are. Okay. You just need a little bit of help. She was right. She made the right call. Personal subject for me meaning this touches me on such a personal level. I cannot convey my level of caring for people who feel suicidal, and I cannot convey my level of passion for helping them actually find a life worth living for. 
Yeah, and that's one of Teal Swan's strengths is that she has talked about her own suicidal thoughts and attempts and can really empathize with people who are going through that. Many people in my field are similar, where they have or had had thoughts like that and can self-disclose that to clients and say, I've been there before, and mm. I had a very intense time when I was younger. At the very least, it can help you to just know more about what it would be like to go through that, because it's very important in treatment for people of any condition, but particularly if you're having suicidal thoughts, that the client feels that they are understood, that their feelings are heard in a way that they're trying to convey. In fact, a major factor in suicidal thoughts and attempts and motivation is feeling disconnected from other people. It's, Bull. Ding, 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 ding. it's not the only factor, but what we call it is thwarted belongingness. That's what we call it in the research literature. In that when people feel as though they're trying to belong, but they feel <laughs> thwarted and it's chronic, it seems to just be never subsiding, then the individual might have suicidal thoughts that mm -hmm. will emerge from there. So that's what I said. I never want to die, girls. You make me want to die. And I'm like, oh, just leave me alone. And that's why when people are like, oh, my gosh, Brittany, you need to do this. You need to do this. You need. I need to do nothing but meditate in my home. Thank you so much. Peace and love. Like, I know what I'm doing. Literally, I'm my favorite company other than my husband and my cat. And I love everybody else in my life so much. But absolutely – Hanging out with people that are like, if you were only more like me on a constant basis is exhausting. And I love you all so much. But I am not like you because I am not you. But yet in the ways that we are similar, that's where the beauty is. And we should stay right there in which ways we are similar. And which ways we are not similar, we may debate and had discuss in a human like way. But ultimately, like I want to go home. Okay? I want to go home to my house. Okay. So if we can make people feel as though they belong, i.e. listening to them, making them feel like they are understood and validated, that can reduce suicidal thoughts. And by the way, trigger warning. My sister was really good at this. Like when I was really, really suicidal and like four years clean, thank you. Um, my sister was like my go-to, my bestie was my go-to. Um, they were just like my rocks during this time. So I was really lucky I had people and even though I tried to go to other people, they just couldn't quite always be exactly what I needed. But my bestie and my sister were like, they were really, really there for me. They were really, um, for the longest time, right? Because I've known them both like 20 something years. So my sister, I've known her her whole life. And then my friend and I have known each other since we were nine. So I've known those two people the longest. And they've been with me since day one of like suicidal ideations. And so they know, like, gosh, I started confiding in my friend earlier than my sister. My sister's five years younger. So I started confiding in my friend when I was like, maybe, I don't even know, I'd have to ask her 14, 13, 15. I would have to ask her when I first told her. And then my sister, when she was much older, um, I don't remember when, but she finally realized, like, I was going through it. Um, but yeah, they've known the longest and they've been like the biggest rocks and support for me, which I really appreciate. So I was really lucky. Warning, of course, all my content. Since oh, and P.S., they never called on me. They never called anybody. They never told cops. They never did any of those things. Because, like, in our bubble, like, you don't do that to people you love. You don't lock people you love up, right? You do whatever it takes to get the right medical professionals involved if you have to. But you don't lock your loved ones up, okay? Like, even my homie who went through psychosis, like, anytime I went with their family to the hospital and, like, they would be like, oh, do you want to put them in a facility? Be like, no. And even the doctors, by the way, would be like, you don't want to put them in a facility during COVID, dude. Like, you're never going to see them. Like, COVID's crazy. And I was like, okay, no. Like, they're already undergoing psychosis. You want to lock them up? No. Like, we just took them home. Every police we talked to, every, like, doctor we talked to, um, and thank God, I'm sorry. Like, their parents were so, like, able to handle it. But it also helped that I knew a little bit. I was like, mm -mm, we don't need to do this. Um, we don't need to do this. It was the best thing we did for our friend was like not putting them in a facility. But I know other people probably think that's the best thing to do. But like it was it would have been the worst call ever. And we're just so lucky that everybody in that bubble that we ended up talking to all the doctors and nurses and cops, all of them agreed like. Don't put them in. Don't don't do that. You know what I mean? 
since this is a psychology YouTube channel, <laughs> may contain triggering material. This episode obviously is. Ah, you know, great question, Nero. Was it ever that bad that calling the police on you would have been a reasonable option? When someone has suicidal ideations and they're attempting, when is the right time to call the cops? That's the question we have to ask ourselves, right? When is the right time to call the cops, right? And honestly, can I be real with you? I'm not sure that there's ever a right time, but I'm not sure that there, you know, what, what that means, right? So that's the question you have to ask yourself. I'm not here to make the judgment. I say never. I say only call them if you can't like take the knife out of their hand. But otherwise, like don't call the cops, like talk your friend down and sit with them and watch anime. Like, what are you doing calling the authorities and putting it on their record for what? You know what I mean? But, you know, that's up to you guys. Like, when do you guys think is the right time to call the cops if you know your friend is going through it? And that's the question, right? When is it ever that bad? Like, what does that mean? I don't know. For some people, it's like the moment someone says they have a thought. For other people, it's like when they can't tackle them and grab the knife from their hands. For some people, everyone has a different like limit. You know what I mean? Laid in with it. So make sure that you take care of yourself. If you are at risk of being triggered by any of this material, make sure that you talk with your therapist before watching anything like yes, this. It's, it's very critical that you do that. Find strategies that helps them to no longer feel suicidal. The standard mainstream approach to mental illness and to suicidality does not work as well as it needs to. And I'm not the only person saying this. Uh, well, yeah, um, the standard approach. I don't know what she means by that. If she's talking about the standard of care or the expert and specialized approach doesn't work as well as it needs to, do people take their own life even though they are in specialized psychological psychotherapeutic treatment yeah unfortunately that happens but okay i will interrupt and then we'll see what they say i think she means to say because this is what i mean by it but i don't think she has the skill to do what she does what she's doing with it it's obvious to me that we need philosophy and therapy to work together it's like obvious to me that therapy alone isn't enough to give someone purpose Purpose is philosophy, right? So obviously values, understanding yourself, having a place in the universe, that needs to coincide and therapists aren't philosophers. So I think therapy alone isn't going to help. Medication alone isn't going to help. It's just going to band-aid, which is great. And maybe you already have the philosophy going in, so you're good to go. But if you don't have the philosophy going into therapy, I think you're really gonna struggle. I really contribute my recovery to philosophy, reading thousands of books, understanding myself and being curious about why I'm here on the planet and therapy, right? Because if, like, if I had a, like, again, like so, so much of my struggle was my inability to regulate my emotions and to um, understand that I was splitting or to, you know, that kind of stuff. But again, um, I, I think that the modern approach to therapy could be fearful, which annoys me. Like it annoys me how scared people are of unaliving uh, themselves. Like the modern approach to unaliving themselves in therapy is like, like my first therapist, I, I won't treat you unless you get on meds. It's like, why are you so afraid, girl? I'm the one paying you $145 to tell you I'm suicidal. What are you so afraid of? Like you're weak. Like you're weak, you're a weak therapist, okay? Like how dare you say I'm ready to help a client you can't even deal with somebody who wants to die. Like acting like wanting to die is the worst thing ever is so disconnected from reality. I'm sorry, you're in the most privileged, silly bubble I've ever heard of in my life. If you literally think suicide is like the craziest thing you've ever heard of, you don't think people are slowly committing suicide by literally smoking every day? Like getting, like, come on, come on, come on, we're all self-harming. So the, I, well, not all, but like the people who are self-harming are self-harming. Just because they disguise it better doesn't mean it's not happening. People are so in the suburb, dude. They're so just like, everybody's happy and everyone's great and everything is. Girl, half the people teaching your kids are having mental breakdowns, okay? Half the people who like give you care at the hospital are having mental breakdowns. Like the idea that we're all just like, everything's fine, everything's fine. For some people, sure. On a spectrum, some people are doing more fine than others. Okay, but obviously you need philosophy, you need an understanding, you need a value system, you need a reason why to sort of have a relationship with your consciousness and you need to tackle your mental health, obviously. 
when people are treated by someone. And I don't mean to say obviously, like obviously. I mean, that's my suggestion. One who knows what they're doing, which is a whole other issue, that there's a, a huge lack of training. And a, there are lots of research studies indicating within our own field, we study this ourselves. We study ourselves in terms of our competence regarding suicidal treatment and prevention. What we have found about ourselves is that the vast majority of people in my field are not properly trained. It's, yeah. not, a, it's not a requirement for graduate school education to have these included. That's mm. changing over time as awareness is growing about this fact. So yes, it's true that many in my field are undertrained, still believe in very strange myths, and have poor effectiveness ratings of their treatment. But if you go to a specialist, someone who has specialized education such as myself, and that's increasing more and more every day, then the rate of successful treatment dramatically increases, Let's of course. Let's go. So we need to update. Um, Kenny says, is there a correct philosophy? No. That isn't no. Cass says, what does it mean to have a correct philosophy? Exactly. No. I don't know if she's talking about all of people in my field, you know, including psychologists, marriage family therapists, counselors, psychiatrists. Well, I mean, obviously there's only a correct philosophy based off the bubble, right? Psychiatrists, social workers, psychiatric nurses. I, I don't, let's see what she's referring to. This is the reason why. Ooh, but I will say some philosophy is closer to objective truth than others. I would say obviously some philosophies are closer to objective truth, whatever that means, big T truth, whatever that means than other philosophies. So philosophy is like a way of thinking, a uh, seeking of knowledge and wisdom, um, an understanding of ethics and morals. So obviously if you're engaging with philosophy through ethics and morals, you're saying, this is my philosophy on life. Here are my ethics and morals. So of course in that way it's all subjective. And then there's a uh, interest in philosophy in the sense of understanding like the metaphysical and the physical and understanding like your place in the universe and the consciousness and all that stuff. And then that's more like centered around like what is and what is like truth, which is different than what's your personal philosophy on life. Every time I hold trainings, I have psychologists and psychiatrists who are flocking to these trainings of mine, trying to learn new approaches for mental illness, trying to learn new approaches to suicidality. See, okay, so you know how people are always like, oh, is Brittany's work like Teal Swans? No, I, I don't, I don't have this thing. I'm not thinking like, oh, I really hope a therapist watches my stuff and helps the mentally ill. Like, I'm talking about philosophy, kids. Like, my thing is different. I literally think I am purely in a philosophy bubble to some extent. Obviously, I love mental health stuff. But I'm watching Dr. Kirk to see if I can understand people better, to explain philosophy better, and also dissect philosophy better. But obviously, like, I would go to Dr. Kirk or Dr. K or somebody like that who's, like, very well-versed in therapy in mental health and then till swan she's trying to play a game i don't like which is i have no qualifications and no center of study but i want to be the person that psychologists come to to learn from i don't want that i don't want a psychologist to be like oh i should watch Brittany simon to understand therapy like no you should watch philosophers to understand how to help your mental health mental um mentally ill patients get a foundation for their beliefs which is different but Teal Swan in her last sentence did it not sound like she was saying that she herself is contributing to like the improvement of mental health. Like, mm, I don't know about that. Here, watch. This is the reason why every time I hold trainings, I have psychologists and psychiatrists who are flocking to these trainings of mine, trying to learn new approaches for mental illness, trying to learn new approaches to suicidality. Okay, yeah. I, I think she's an extremely popular, I don't know what to call her, a self-help teacher. Are there people in my field that attend her trainings? Yeah, I don't doubt that. But if someone came to me and said, I feel under-trained regarding suicide, what should I do? I would say, well, one, there's a lot of courses in our field that are competent and helpful. It, it might take... No, no, no. Insisting your patient gets medication is her value, not a sign of weakness. No, she didn't have a justification for it. She said, I'm not going to treat you any further until you get medication. That's the first therapist I had. In what world 
is your patient saying, hey, bro, I was like suicidal. I need some help with this. And her response is, I'm not going to see you anymore unless you get meds. When I already told her I need time before meds. So she took a sick person who already told her I feel trapped. I feel like unsafe. Oh, let me feel make you feel more unsafe by threatening you. She was obviously a therapist who was interested in a paycheck. I'm sorry. You do not treat people that way. If you're trying to help them, you do not threaten them and give them an ultimatum, right? It has nothing to do with her values, her value. Well, it has something to do with her values of keeping herself safe. It sounded more like she didn't want to deal with a suicidal patient, right? Insisting your patient gets medication is her value. She didn't do it. Like she said, hey, Brittany, I definitely think medication would help you. I definitely want to see you get better. It was, I am afraid unless you get medication, you might die under my watch. That was absolutely the vibe. And I was right to fire her and get a better therapist who, oh, ding, 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 never needed me to get meds because she didn't react that way because she actually was interested in helping me. And even if she had given me meds, she would have said, hey, Brittany, I think with all the information you've given me, let's try an antidepressant. Let's try some help with anti-anxiety medication. I would have been like, okay, because she would have said, hey, I want to treat you and I think this would really benefit you. But instead, the first therapist gave a sick patient an ultimatum, right? Like, what? Girl, we were like six sessions in. What are you giving me an ultimatum for? Like, makes no sense, bro. If you're trying to help people. And again, like, just in my opinion, not very helpful. Take a while. It could take you a number of months of... But maybe that's also what's going on in this video is we're talking about approaches to mental health. I thought that was a very bad approach to mental health patients, but maybe some patients would have benefited from that. Somewhat intensive training to really get it all. Two is to find a- Oh yeah, true. She also, Teal Swan claims to be an indigo psychic like Star Child. Mentor or a supervisor who specializes in this, who can guide you and find other resources, books, this kind of thing. And with that, you are likely to have a competent and helpful approach to suicide. The bottom line, you guys, is that if it worked, they wouldn't be looking for alternatives. Just this week, the head of the University of Pennsylvania Mental Health Services committed suicide. I don't know Ooh. exactly what she's saying, but it appears that she's saying that everyone in my field doesn't know what they're doing. I mean, I'm exaggerating. And as evidence of that, people in my field are dying by suicide. We could say that about all sorts of things. Like there are physicians who smoke cigarettes, even though it's not a good idea to do that. Or there are Olympic swimmers who die of drowning. I mean, it, it doesn't really say much. Epidemic that we need to solve together. Having been suicidal myself, having attempted suicide myself, having worked for years with people who are suicidal, having the extrasensory perception that I have that allows me to understand why- Because she's an alien. Why thoughts and emotions work the way they do, uniquely qualifies me to be talking about a new approach to dealing with suicidality. Oof, see, I don't wanna be this. I don't think I have a new approach. I think like I have, I'm reworking an old approach. See, I think we need to rework re new approaches and old approaches together. But I do feel like, mm, does she have a new approach? Maybe for some people, right? She has helped people, so you know what? Okay, I don't know what to say about that. She says she has ESP, meaning yeah. I think that she can read people's minds. There's been a lot of research on that, obviously, for decades and decades. We've looked at it from various different angles and there is absolutely no evidence that ESP exists. Imagine if it did. Psychologists have been looking at that for a long time. In fact, I would even possibly say we've been researching that for over a hundred years and there's no evidence of that. Now, some of the claims made by people who ha claim to have supernatural powers are not testable by science. They will say, well, I read this person's mind and then the person you know, that they read the mind will say, oh my God, that person read my mind. And then when we put the person claiming they have ESP in a situation where they have to read someone's mind who isn't a follower, then we find that they can't guess any better than chance. And what the people that claim they have ESP will say is, well, when I'm put to the test, the subject is hostile or the situation, the vibes aren't quite right. So maybe ESP exists in a very limited fashion for people. I think this is my concern. Like, okay, wait, Nero, you said, I do think she's very intuitive about people's emotions and thoughts though. Well, obviously, right? She has enough charisma to get like followers. She has a vibe. She has a thought process. She has like enough of a community building skill. She's very talented in building social marketing. She has this goal, according to the Hulu series, of being very, very famous. She wants fame. She wants notoriety. She wants like clout. 
But the thing that's interesting about her, I guess, is that she's like definitely in her own bubble. Like she's obviously very successful, but she's so beholden to her beliefs. Like she believes herself, right? And whether it's true or not, like that's the thing is like, whether we agree or not, she, I think, is having an authentic reality with herself that she, like, believes it. And it doesn't even have to be real. Like, people believe in God. So why can't Teal believe she has ESP? People believe they literally can cause miracles. So, you know, whatever, bro. So, again, like, I'm all about her doing her thing in that way. But I think she's probably doing more harm than permanent good in the long run for her bubble, maybe. I think if most of the people in that bubble were being more introspective, they would realize like this isn't helpful anymore. I think her audience is probably a bunch of two Cs. I really do. I don't even think they're ones. I think they're probably two Cs. Um, they're like people with like just enough introspection to see that she's helping and feeling like they're helped. But when I saw the interviews with her audience members, they didn't seem to be the most educated and the most like introspective. They seem to have a somewhat of an understanding about themselves, seem to tackle themselves enough, but not enough to like not pedestal her. And again, if you're worshiping a human, if you're pedestaling another person, like you're not being introspective or extrospective. You're being hopeful and giving yourself to someone else. You're trusting someone else more than you trust yourself. Therefore, how introspective can you be? That doesn't lend itself to empirical observation. But anyway, so she claims that. And there are a lot of people who claim that, a lot of people who believe it. There's a lot of beliefs in the world that aren't supported by science. It doesn't necessarily mean that it doesn't exist, but it just means that as a scientist myself, I just have to say, well, there's a lot of things that people claim that aren't supported by empirical mm -hmm. science. She yeah. says that because of her suicidality in the past and attempts, this uniquely gives her a, an ability to help people. I would say that. She's not unique in that way. Plenty of other self-help people and people in my field will self-disclose around their thoughts. I've mm -hmm. had supervisees who have had deep depression and suicidal thoughts throughout their career. So that, that just, she's not unique in that way. And then she also says because she has ESP, then that makes her unique. I don't, is she saying she's the only person who... Uh, Cass, you said, however, I've read minds before as in I knew what words they were looking for or about to say before they say it but that's more of a pattern recognition not a uh, skill not esp yeah like i have an insane like obviously like my husband and i will have moments where it's like we're reading each other's minds but we're not literally reading each other's minds i can't do that i'm not an x-men like we're just we're just like we know each other well enough that we just like you know we can like finish each other's sentences and like understand where we're going and understand the context and it's probably why I'm pretty good at calls is like, I'm not reading your mind, dude. You're telling me who you are. People tell you who they are. Like people literally will like tell you who they are, even when they think they're being really mysterious. Like if you can read them, you can read them. Right. So it is one of those things um, that I think is like interesting when people are like, I'm an, I'm an empath or I'm having like a big, it's like, it's just like a spectrum of like paying attention and interest in people. I feel like sometimes we're like computers that are just collecting data. And when we see a problem, we just like input the data and come out with the answer. And we're like magic. And we're like, it's data. Like that's why I say the levels aren't necessarily about magic. Like I don't believe in magic. It's about data. How introspective, introspective can you be? Can you understand the nuances of human beings? Can you understand that like people literally believe what they believe and you probably believe most of what you believe and you probably have very little connection to knowledge because knowledge is subjective. And what is knowledge? If like psychology itself is a construct, right? Like what are we talking about in terms of knowledge? We're doing what we're doing is we're putting things together and we're saying this is what I think is happening. Here's a collection of like attributes. We're calling a diagnosis. And here's this thing again. You know what I mean? It is what it is. Like, it is interesting. I think you can learn from everyone. I think you can learn from Teal Swan. She just frustrates me because she is so arrogant and she's so sure she knows what she's talking about while literally espousing like magical powers and beliefs. And I can't handle it. Like, I same way I feel about religious people. Okay. Same thing I feel about religious people. I'm like, can we have this conversation without magic? And they're like, no. And I'm like, oh my God. Like, you have no proof for this magic, bro. You just have your personal experience with it. But it's probably just literally data. It's data coming together and then you're processing the information. Who claims to have ESP? I don't know. Maybe we'll get some more information. 
And this is what I can tell you. The standard approach does not work. Okay. <laughs> I didn't think we would get quite a definitive statement. I thought that she would What did she say? What did she of... say? <laughs> the standard approach does not work. For some people. Okay. <laughs> I didn't think we would get quite a definitive statement. I thought that she would kind of dance around that a little bit. That's kind of what it sounded like. She... Oh, and by the way, hold on. When I get my friend to read my tarot cards, she's really good at it. When she reads my tarot cards, she is basically like, the cards have absolutely predicted my future. They've been absolutely accurate. I contribute that to two things. One, some sort of recognizing that even though we're unique, we're not that unique, right? Kind of like accepting determinism as like a concept or like some things are determined by biology or statistical probability. And also the reality that my friend is so intuitive slash can understand the cards in relation to how she knows me and can kind of like categorize me appropriately and like just read what the cards mean and then me adapting that reality to my life now often when she's read my cards I'll forget what they are because I'm not in the tarot bubble I just visit it and then I'll live my life and then I'll remember my tarot read and I'm like oh oh that was right on point bro but I don't know what came first the chicken or the egg I don't know if I'm fulfilling the subconscious knowledge of the tarot reading or if if what? Like, I don't know. You know what I mean? Or if it's a statistical probability. I don't know if the tarot is so connective to people. Like, people really love tarot because it actually allows you to kind of see how predictable life is. Or if life itself isn't that predictable. And it's that, you know, I don't know which one came first. Um, you know what I mean? It's just interesting. She was saying earlier, but she just said that statement. <laughs> the standard approach does not work. Pretty sure she's referring to me that I am completely as a clinician ineffective at preventing and helping people with their suicide, which I find to be insulting, one, wrong, two, and not supported by the evidence, by the way, when we actually study this, when people seek out experts in suicidal prevention and treatment. And when I say suicidal prevention and treatment, I'm not just talking about addressing the suicide. And by the way, um, the same way that Tarot, you guys are writing comments about predictability, right? I thought you believed in the metaphysical. I believe in the concept of the metaphysical. That's different. I'm open to the concept of the metaphysical. I think there is obviously the metaphysical, but I think the metaphysical is just unknown to us, which then makes it in the future, non-metaphysical. Like, I think if gods existed, it would cease being metaphysical. You know what I'm saying? Like, what, is, what does it mean to be metaphysical, right? So in my head, I'm open to anything that's undescribed and outside of our physical reality as being possibly true and real, but not any more special than the fact that we even exist in the first place. We exist. I am a consciousness having an interaction with you. If that's not magical, I don't know what magic is. But of course, I don't believe in the magic like Harry Potter magic. I have no proof of God. I have no proof of these things. But then when people have these miracles happen to them where they feel connected or in France, where there's like that water from the Lords, from Lords, and the miracle happens with like the cancer patients and the sick patients and the doctors don't know what it is. Like that's interesting and that's something I want to explore. And so I'm open to the idea that there could be some sort of something happening somewhere. But once we discover it and call it something, I mean, it just becomes like reality. And what is reality, right? Reality itself, I think, is pretty magical. Thoughts or helping people not to attempt. Experts will take the holistic approach. There's everything, you know, why do they feel that way? What's going on with them? There usually are a lot of other issues going on with the individual. How is their life going? Do they feel validated? Have they ever felt validated? Do they have trauma in their history that needs to be recovered from? Or do they have addiction? So not only is that wrong, and I just have to say insulting and disheartening that someone would say that, and she has a lot of followers. I mean, she has over a million subscribers because mm -hmm. one of the weird things about my field mm -hmm. is that some amazing things are happening in the therapy office. And, you know, because of confidentiality, it's never published. These amazing things are happening. I, you know, I've supervised people or I have colleagues and I've obviously worked with a lot of clients myself where I get chills thinking about the glory 
and the satisfaction and the wonderfulness and the love and the joy of helping someone to emerge out of depression Mm -hmm. and or suicidal thoughts. Mm -hmm. It's it's just one of the... Honestly, when I told Dr. Kurakonda when I collabed with him that my like therapist saved my life and I'm so much better off, he seemed genuinely so happy for me. Good vibes, Mr. Mr. Dr. Kurkonda. Like he genuinely seemed so happy for me. Sometimes when I tell people that, you can see them being like cynical. You can see them definitely being like, but did she help you? Did she help you? Like he genuinely seemed like very excited about it. I, I definitely believe in his interest in helping people. Like I fully think like Dr. Kurkonda is like very interested in actually helping people. Um, As my therapist was like, she was just so fabulous, you know? best things you can ever do it's so there's so much suffering in the world and to be on the ground level and it makes me want to cry just thinking about helping those people get out of those moments or at the very least getting them through even just one day where they are given some shred of hope or some shred of self-esteem or some shred of not being demoralized anymore feeling like they belong feeling like maybe people care and to be able to do that is one of the biggest reasons I became a therapist and one of the best things I've ever done in my life, honestly. So to hear her say that I'm not effective, it just hurts my feelings. And two, to say this to all of her followers, to steer people away Mm -hmm. from help. I mean, Mm -hmm. I don't know if she's saying this directly, but it sounds like- That's the problem with Teal Swan. She sounds kind of like culty, which is why I was like so shocked that some of you thought we did similar work again. To be a whole human being, you have to have a relationship with mental health, go see professionals, and then philosophy help, which is more like what Teal Swan is doing. But Teal Swan is too big for her britches, ma'am. And she's claiming an understanding of psychology and philosophy. And I just think that's very misguided and very arrogant. Very culty. It's like she's saying she's uniquely qualified, meaning she's the only one who can help people with suicide. Mm. How many people, I don't know, have watched her video and are like, well, okay, I'm never going to go to a specialist in this area, someone who can care about me and someone who can treat the suicidal thoughts and everything else, someone who's a a specialist, someone who has thought about suicide themselves. I'm not going to go to anyone like that. I'm only going to go to her. That's irresponsible. The perspective of somebody who is suicidal is unfathomable to most people. Most people have an intense fear of death, so they approach death as if it's the worst thing that could ever happen. Yes, that's true. Uh, I think particularly Americans, and I've been talking about this for years, and people in suicidology mm-hmm. will talk about this as well, that it's a huge taboo to talk about to talk about mm-hmm. death and also to talk about suicide. And Stop it right now. Y'all just have a similar vibe for some reason, similar flavors of confidence and self, uh, mm, hold on here, and confident, self-assured women. Man, that's like saying women are like a monolith. We do not have the same energy, bros. I'm like a boy. She's a girl, bro. She's like a narcissistic mother, bro. (laughs) I'm a dad. (laughs) I'm a boy. (laughs) No, I don't know. That's interesting. Yeah, I don't see it, man. She makes me so pissed, bro. She just has no chill, bro. She would not be fun to hang out with. And that really hinders us as a society when we are trying to help people with a variety of things, with death and dying, with grief, and with suicide. And since our uh, professionals in psychology and psychotherapy and counseling emerge from our culture or are embedded in the culture, also have taboos around. If I was a boy, I would understand. You're not the pearl, for example. You're not like pearl. Oh, that's true. Yeah. I mean, I guess we're similar in the sense that we are like exploring like the human consciousness in like a different way. But for the record, I do not think I'm a seed, star child, whatever. I don't think I have the ability to read minds. Teal is a freak. Talking about death and suicide, which could be a big reason. As to- okay, but wait, if you could read minds, though, like, would you ever tell anyone? Because, bitch, you would never know. I wouldn't tell a soul. If I could read minds, I would tell my husband and that's it. I'm not going to tell none of you bitches. There's no way I'm about to tell no bitch I could read minds. There's no way you couldn't get it out of me for a billion dollars, bro. You think I want the government experimenting on me? This is how I know she don't read minds. If you could really read minds, do you really think you'd be out here telling people? Girl, sit down, girl. 
to why it's not even included in most training programs. Last I checked the research, that was true. So yes, that's, that's true. And I'm guessing what she's getting at is that because she actually talks about it, because I know that she does, she is actually doing a... True, she would not host a Smash Bros. tournament, which by the way, I wanted to do this month, so it's coming. I just got to take a poll when you guys want to do it. ...public good by saying, I'm going to go against the grain regarding our society, and I'm going to talk about it. And when I do, lots of people come to me, which I could absolutely imagine happening, and, and I would praise her for actually raising awareness about that. This is not the perspective of the people who are suicidal hold. People who are suicidal view death as an escape hatch that gets them out of unfathomable amounts of pain. That's true. It's the only relief that they can find mm -hmm. to torture. Now, I'm going to argue with you that if you are going to change someone's perspective, you have to get deep enough into it to understand that perspective. And this is what we have to do with people who are suicidal. Absolutely. Mm. And I love that she's saying this that she's tying it to the suffering. It's mm -hmm. something that's quite obvious to experts and I guess people mm -hmm. who are helping people with this and also for people who have gone through it that suicidal thoughts is a solution. It's an escape hatch, as she says, to tremendous suffering. It just seems like it's the only way out. And that's why mm -hmm. when we actually treat people, we mm -hmm need to figure out where does that motivation generate mm -hmm. from. The first thing we need to do is create safety just to get them through that. Exactly. Safety. Time and we have to assess the risk. And once we are fairly certain that the individual is not imminently at risk of attempting, then we want to start looking into where does this generate from and how can we relieve that? How can we help them with that? If they are in an abusive relationship, then we want to address that if they have trauma and PTSD and other kinds of schemas that are causing a lot of problems for them, we want to address that. If they're being treated in a sexist, misogynistic, racist, ableist, mm -hmm. classist, mm -hmm. ageist way in their workplace or in their home or in society, we want to address that. We can't change society and all those issues, but we can help people with that. We can validate them. Do they feel alone? Do they feel like no one cares? Did they just go through a breakup? Are they suffering from addiction? You know, yeah, absolutely. We, we want to look at what is the cause, which is the standard approach in my field. In fact, a big part of my model, which is not, I didn't invent. And to be fair, Dr. Kirkonda practices in Seattle. So he is more progressive and much more aware of mental health. Now that every therapist in Seattle has that as we just told the story. But it's one of the models that I have adopted is phenomenological narrative listening, which is that when people talk about whatever they're talking about as a client, but particularly about this, is I need to enter their world. I need to really understand what's happening for them, and I need to put aside any kind of assumptions that I have. Phenomenology is a philosophy, but it, in a nutshell, is we have to assume that other people's experience and their lived experience is difficult to understand at first. You really have to take the time and our own biases and assumptions and our own experiences will stand in the way of really understanding people. So we have to bracket, we have to put our own assumptions on the shelf so we can really listen and we have to ask a lot of questions, clarifications, like when you say that, I don't know what you mean, you know, even just saying, for someone to say that they're in a lot of emotional pain or they feel completely demoralized mm. or they, their, their life doesn't seem worth living, I might hear stuff, something like that and think I know what they mean, but phenomenology tells us that that's a topic sentence, but what does it really mean to them? And when we really understand someone, it helps us as clinicians because we're assessing better, but it also has a scientifically empirically found result that the individual will just feel less suicidal because someone is taking the time, someone really gets them, which is countering that thwarted belongingness, right? Mainstream mental health professionals would say that we need to get suicidal people to stop focusing on this way that they feel, stop focusing on their perspective about death and suicide, and instead focus on the goodness of life. Mm. But this makes people who are suicidal feel worse. Mainstream, again, she's using these words like standard and mainstream. Are mm. there some clinicians who will miss the mark and in a very heavy-handed way try to get the client in this 
anxious and I've seen this before. I'm that's what I'm saying with my first therapist. She didn't know, she didn't understand suicide. She made a I'm not saying she's like a horrible person, but I'm saying she's a bad therapist for people with suicidal ideations, which is specific. Like if you have a client who even talks about suicidal ideations and you can't get down and dirty with them and have the conversation, you need to move the fuck on. Like I remember my like the therapist that was amazing. Like I tell this story where I told her I was like, hey, like I here's my life story. I want to unalive myself. And she's like, no wonder, dude, your life's hard. I was like, thank you. Thank you. She goes, let's make it easier. And I was like, okay, that was it. That's all it fucking took. She saw me. She wasn't afraid of it. And she goes, yeah, it sounds hard. Let's make it easier. And I was like, okay, cool. Hello, ma'am. Thank you. That's all I fucking wanted. Instead, people are like, oh my God, you want to kill yourself? Oh my God, I can't believe it. Oh my God. Well, literally everything on the media all the time is like the world is ending. Taxes are crazy. You're never going to pay for lunch. Oh my gosh, you want to eat a banana? $27. And I don't know how y'all don't want to unalive yourself. Hello, have you seen food prices? Have you seen gas prices? That's what I'm saying. You guys, like, I can't tell if people want to unalive themselves or just introspective enough to know, like, oh, my God, life is kind of hard. Or if everybody else is like, life is hard, but, like, whatever, it's better than death. Like, death is like a nap, bro. You're escaping the pain. And then when you got on the other side of it, it's like, how do I find a better game to play? How do I find a better game to play? Because I'm paying $27 for a banana. I'm not paying a penny for a banana. I don't even like bananas. That was a bad example. I should have used strawberries. But you know what I'm saying? I wonder, Brittany, if you can someday make an in-depth video about your therapy, like what you did. I feel similar to you in a lot of ways and trying to figure out what kind of therapy I need. No. I did DBT therapy. That's the kind of therapy I did. And that's the most in-depth I will talk about it. And if you need to go to a therapist, try a DBT therapist if you think like what I'm saying relates to you. But me going into in-depth about my therapy, one, way too personal. And two, not very helpful because you're not me. But DBT is very helpful to a lot of people. So if you see any kind of relationship or like relatability, like go try DBT. You have to spend the money to figure it out. I spent $600 on a therapist that gave me no help, but did lead me to the right therapist. And then I spent thousands of dollars on her and it was worth it. Put it on a credit card, baby, and paid it off later. Okay. And I've trained people who initially will do this. And I, you know, obviously work with them to not do this, that their fear of death, that their fear of being incompetent because they haven't been trained well, or they don't have proper support, mentorship, supervision, con consultants, are there clinicians who in a panic will just say, well, don't think about that. And you got to think about the good. And by the way, finding the right therapist is very difficult. Recovery is very difficult. Nothing about getting better is easy. And I want to say this because I want to prepare you guys because even Dr. Kirkonda talks about this where people will get a therapist and think like, okay, fix me. It's been five sessions. Dr. Kirk is very different than me. He thinks you need like years of therapy, like 10, 15 years sometimes. He thinks everyone needs at least five years of therapy, which I think is very cute. And I don't, don't quote me, but like that's what I've heard him say. And I always think like, Dr. Kirk, we can't afford 15 years of therapy, okay, sir? But I do think it is true you need therapy as a tool, whether it's one session or 100 sessions, right? But it, you have to do the work to figure it out. You can't like read a book and someone's going to tell you, get this kind of therapy, and then it works. Some borderlines don't benefit from DBT therapy, even though it was made for them. So again, you're really seeking out a tool that's going to work for you as a unique consciousness. And in order to do that, you're going to have to trial and error. You're going to have to take a risk. And that's what usually stops people is they get afraid to spend the money on therapy. They get afraid to take the risk. They go, well, what's the point if I don't even know if it will help? That's why introspection is hard. That's why healing is hard. Because it's much easier just to give up and say, well, oh, I'm not going to try. Good things in life. Yes, that happens, right? And but she's saying mainstream. So I don't I don't know what she means by that. There are plenty of people and it's increasing every day proportionally, I believe, given the research that people in my field wouldn't use that heavy handed approach. Are there people that do? Yeah. People who are genuinely suicidal, they're thinking about suicide everywhere they go. If they're in a room, they're thinking about all the possible ways in that room that they could do it. Well, this that wasn't my experience. Like I wasn't, I was suicidal all the time, but I wasn't like the room made me do it. I was just like, dying sounds nice. I should die. Dying sounds great. When I get home, I'm going to die. 
Because, like, I have responsibilities, okay? I nannied for a living. I couldn't kill myself right there. This, on top of planning out the way that they would choose to do it, if they could choose anyway, is a kind of unconscious rehearsal process, which actually brings them... You know, she generalizes. For a person that's trying to help the people that aren't mainstream, she generalizes. Relief. Yeah, I mean, not everyone that has suicidal thoughts is that intense, but many do, and pointing that out is helpful, I think. Ah, uh, Kashmir says, my ego thinks if I watch enough therapy content that, I'll re that it will replace getting therapy. If only... It's a good, it's a good, it's a good band-aid, but if only. I'm telling you, there's nothing like one-on-one -on -one work. I like one-on-one -on -one work. Some people do group. I can't do group. I fucking can't work with people. But I will say, like, n therapy is really real. That's why I got upset when people accused me of, like, doing fake therapy during my calls. Guys, therapy is a very specific skill. It truly is an art form if done correctly. It is so different than anything that I do. I'm not a therapist. I've never been trained as a therapist. I have no idea how to mimic what I learned in DBT. I couldn't even tell you how to do DBT. I'm not a therapist. That's why I'm like, no, what we're doing is philosophy. You need to go to therapy. It is such a unique experience if you get the right therapist. If you really get the right person mixed in with like your own work on philosophy on the side, it is a very unique tool. I really liked my therapist. I had a really good experience with her. I think, but then she says that it brings relief to think about and rehearse it. Yes, that's also true. And I will say that there are a lot of motivations for suicide. I mean, one is the type that she's talking about, but there are other motivations like people who have a terminal illness. And I guess you could argue it's because they're suffering, but for some people they're thinking, I, and maybe I'll get into this at some point, but there's debate within suicidology, people that are experts in my field around assisted suicide assisted end of death again the why chosen death is i'm ready to die i've made peace with it suicide is i feel trapped and i feel like this is the only way out assisted chosen death because people are truly ready to die beautiful and i do think people can be ready to die obviously or i feel trapped and i feel like all i can do is die that's different death and how do we categorize that, right? Because traditionally we would say, well, that's illegal or that's wrong or no one can help someone do that. But laws are changing all the time, the United States in individual jurisdictions, that in some situations it can be immoral to prevent someone from taking their own life. There are experts in my field for many decades now who have been writing and discussing and researching the idea that there are times when we might find it ethical to actually assist someone in their own suicide. Physician-assisted death, psychologist-assisted death. And in fact, a prominent suicidologist in the early 80s, I believe, Nico Spigers, he was mm -hmm. an expert in suicide and he actually took his own life and he was in the process of publishing a book in which he delineated the criteria that we can follow as clinicians hmm. to determine if it is ethical to assist someone or at least not prevent them from taking their own life. I can't remember off the top of my head, but it involves pretty obvious things like the individual has wanted to die for a long time, the individual is in pain and suffering that cannot be remedied by any other kind of treatment mm. and other kinds of criteria. But that second one is the most important that I mentioned, right? That a lot of people, if not the vast majority, and everyone that I've talked to who have had suicidal thoughts, the reasons why they are in pain and are thus thinking about that escape hatch are possibly remedied by treatment or other kinds of methods. And research shows that. You know what sucks too is because we haven't created a world that is... Well, here's the dilemma. You remember how we watched that girl in Abba and Preach the other day who said she made false calls to CPS to get back at her ex-lover or whatever? Okay, so again, if we have a society full of Dr. Kirkondas and Dr. K's and me's and you's and we're all trying to help each other and we're giving everyone the resources, you get X amount of food every day so you're not starving, you get X amount of money to spend whatever you want on food, your medical care, care is paid for. Everyone goes to therapy or whatever you need. No one's forcing you to do anything, but we're all aiming for healthy, okay? We have a relatively, like, healthy society. When someone's unhealthy, we're, like, very supportive, and we encourage them to change, and they do it, okay? All of society can get better in that way, and it can be really, really a lovely existence. But then you get that girl who calling CPS, okay? And it's like, okay, what do we do now? 
Because where did she come from? Who brought her up? Was it her environment? Who gave her her values? Can she change? Does she know what's wrong? Like what does wrong mean, right? So again, it's like in an ideal society where we could like take away a lot of people's pain, they would still have the meaning crisis, which is where John Verveke comes in. Check it out. The meaning crisis on YouTube. Then you have the meaning crisis about the consciousness, because even if you are healthy, you have all the money in the world, you have everything at your disposal. There's still the meaning crisis that I think all intelligent human beings with a working relationship with their consciousness is seeking after all of those basic things are met. So you go have Maslow's hierarchy of needs, you feed all of the necessaries, and then you have the meaning crisis, John Ferveke, and you have to have a relationship in between those things, right? And so for me, I found and went through my own meaning crisis, right? on my own and I created the levels and the levels helped me figure out my meaning crisis. And then I gave it to other people to help them with their meaning crisis. And John Verveke came up with the meaning crisis and gave it to other people. And Maslow's higher give needs gave it to other. We are all just like creating these things to fulfill some part of our meaning. And then we give it to other people and we share it and we share and we share and we share. And society can be, there's positives to be built off of that. Now, in some ways, Teal is doing the same thing. But again, Teal is doing this thing of the ego, which is like, her way is the best way and other people's tools are bad. And I would argue all tools are helpful, but all tools are only meaningful for the people they're helpful for. So like her tools would not be very helpful for me because I wouldn't trust her. I wouldn't trust her to give me any sort of insight into my own consciousness. I, I trust a little bit more traditional philosophers or people who have a relationship with the consciousness in like a deep, profound way. I feel her to be very shallow in my opinion, but I don't know. And so it is one of those things where like maybe someone finds her to be very, very self-aware. Saying you can read minds is a little hard for me to contend with in terms of like seeking reality. Because my whole thing was, I want to know what's real. I want to know what's real, real. And in a world where everyone seems to be lying to themselves, it's really hard to find that out. So again, we can't have a perfect society because one of the biological defects of a human being is that we will lie to ourselves out of a need for survival. And so the world like creates liars because it's always trying to survive and it's afraid of each other. We can't even as patients talk to our mental he mental um, health care providers because they are worried for us. And so they call the cops on us or hospitalize us or don't treat us as people. They can't meet us. So Teal thinks because this is happening, they should all listen to me. And I'm saying, well, they should listen to many people, but like many good people exist and her way isn't the end all be all for all of us, right? So I'm more of a Verveke girl or like a Socrates Plato girl. I'm more of a, I'll even read Rand girl. I'd rather go to Rand than Teal Swan. You know what I'm saying? Like I, I would rather go to something that's trying to find objective truth than somebody who thinks there's a star seed children and they're, I don't go to religious people, even though religion is very helpful. Religious philosophy ends up falling short because even though it's poetic and beautiful and interesting, it falls short of like reality and contextualizing that reality. So again, when you're like bubble hopping and seeking tools, hopefully you're doing it to bring yourself up and therefore maybe share it with society. No obligation there. But again, like what do we do with the outliers in society? So obviously we don't even know why people want to commit suicide yet. As a whole, we don't even know if we could improve society to such a degree, maybe they would never want to. But then you would have to start really recognizing that your best friends are rapists, that your politicians are liars, that your parents did fuck up. Like you would have to start really acknowledging the society is very flawed, accepting it, embracing it, and then moving for redemption. Because again, just like Zuko in our last podcast yesterday, it's not that Zuko was perfect. It wasn't that he didn't serve jail time because he didn't do a crime. He didn't serve jail time because we forgave the consciousness that he is because he fundamentally transformed, right? He transformed into a new person. I think Maiden left that comment on my video, right? He didn't just change, he transformed. You need to transform yourself. It's not just about the simplicity of change because change can just be an action. You need to transform from consciousness to brain to body to soul, whatever that means, right? You need to fundamentally transform. Right. And that's very hard to do because it also means dispelling the ego and finding humility. It also means like seeking an understanding that I don't know and that's OK. And that makes me know more than other people who don't even know because their beliefs are so clouding their judgment that they know less than I know because they have a belief that's blocking them. Look, I believe most people are good. I have no evidence for this. My only real evidence that human beings overall are good is that overall we've done better over time. That technically, statistically, there is less violence and less starvation and less everything in the world. Yeah, that's it. That's literally my evidence as most people are good. And that 
anecdotally, when I meet people, they seem really sort of well-intentioned, even though they're really doing pretty awful things to each other. But they seem well-intentioned, right? They kind of seem well-intentioned. And I'm like, okay, well, intentions, you know, the road to, the road to hell is paved in good intentions. But you still get a point for a good intention, even if you end up destroying a whole populace because of your good intentions, right? Yeah. Uh, in other words, if I or anyone else has a problem with how Brittany organizes her world, we should figure it out, organize ourselves. Wait, organize for ourselves. That's harder than it looks. See, I know what we are talking about. I just want to understand another's bubble. Mm. Yeah. Just curious if you have any uh, besties who are academics and professors. Do I have any best friends that like work at colleges or something? No. No, I don't. I have some teachers, but not professors. And I have some like people in the science fields, like, but I don't have any like academic or professors or I don't know anyone who works at university or anything like that. Not, not, not anybody close to me. I know people who know people, but I don't know anyone, like no one in my inner circle works at a university or anything like that. And so these are extremely rare circumstances. Like, I don't know if you remember a famous case that was in the mainstream media, Brittany Maynard died. Oh my God, just kidding, it's not funny. In, I don't know, maybe like 10 years ago or something, it was in the news quite a bit. She had terminal brain yeah. cancer. Yeah, Brittany! Brittany's my favorite example of chosen death, which is different. She chose it with her husband and her family at her side. Brittany's my favorite example. I believe. And it was 100% certain that she was going to die yep. within a month or two. And it was going to be pretty painful. And there was going to be a lot of discomfort for her. And so mm -hmm. she knew about this in advance and decided. Oh, that's so funny. This is my favorite story. To take her own life. And she. But she did it with her family and friends. Met all those criteria because there was no treatment. She was going to head into more and more suffering. And she, right. it might even change her personality. She might react to people around her in ways that she didn't want to do. And so she just... The physicality of dying is very hard on the body. It's really hard to physically die. It hurts a lot, depending if you're lucky and you fall asleep and you die in your sleep. But Brittany's my favorite example. She had incredibly aggressive cancer. She was married. Her family was with her at the time, and they supported her dying peacefully. Chosen death. Different than suicide, which is usually on impulse, and usually your family and friends find out after, and usually it wasn't planned in like a strategic way. Brittany had a really dignified death. Decided to take her own life. It's a tragic story. She was very young. I think yeah, she, she was, was, I don't know, in her 20s or 30s or something. I, yeah, I think so, so there are some extremely rare cases where it would be considered ethical within my field to mm -hmm. help someone take their own life. I've yeah. never been in a situation like that before. I don't consider that suicide for the record. I consider that chosen death. I consider that literally exactly what I think of as chosen death, not suicide. Suicide is a cry for help, and I think people can be helped, but not always, because, like, that's just life. And then I think chosen death is something you plan for. You're thoughtful. You're considerate of people around you. You're not desperate. You're making a rational decision, right? For it. I don't know if I've known anyone, but those situations do exist, and we might even consider it to be humane and moral to help people about with those sorts of things, right? Now, I will say... If any of you are thinking about suicide or you know someone that is, it can often feel like there is no way out. But in my experience, 99.99999% of the time, there is a way out. It might take a while. Mm -hmm. It might take 10, 15 years of intense like psychotherapy and mm -hmm. other kinds of support, but there is a way out. And that's incredibly important for me to say, obviously, in lieu of this conversation. But anyway, what she's saying is that for people that think about suicide in a chronic, intense manner, the thoughts of suicide are a relief to them because it makes them feel like there's a light at the end of the tunnel, if you will. But if we can give people other lights and other tunnels, then mm -hmm. they always take those, always. Mm -hmm. You know, when you, when you give people other avenues of hope. The right avenues for them, where they feel seen and understood, absolutely. And recovery and support and mm. belongingness and 
actual psychotherapeutic treatment that that works, then people always take mm. that because they don't want to die. They, right. They're they just believe based on what's happening that it's right. the only answer. But of course, right. that isn't the only answer, and that's what we need to raise mm. awareness about. Amen. All right. So I think I'll end it there, and I'll do part two later on. So everyone out there, please take care of yourself because you deserve it. You really, really do. Ugh, so good. Dr. Kirkonda, I'll link it in the chat. Again, just so you guys can go subscribe to his channel if you'd like. I really like his observations. I think he's really kind and compassionate. We don't always agree exactly, but I think generally speaking, I'm more his like vibe. He's more my vibe. Like I, I definitely think he's more my vibe in terms of how he humanizes people and sees people and the complexities between our, you know, um, the complexities within trauma and philosophy and differences between people. So I really like that. He's really self-aware. Ah, oh, Tom Foolery in the chat. What's up? You always show up right when I'm about to end my end my streams, basically. Um, with that said, this is going to be the end of the stream. Does anyone have any anything else on their mind? Any ideas you want to go over? Um, I really like this video. Please go check out Dr. Kirkonda. What a great video. Mm, let's go. Mm, such a good, like, I love watching the self-help, like, philosophy bubbles overlap with the mental health bubbles because... There is a lot of overlap, but they are not the same thing. They are different categories. Remember that. Therapy is not philosophy. But I think for therapy to be its best, you have to have an idea of your own philosophy in life. What is your understanding of yourself? What are your belief systems? And why do you think you're here on this planet, bros? Not just for your sense of purpose, but why do you even think humans as a species evolved? Or slash, why did God make them happen? I don't know what your belief is, but you know what I mean? So why's my life a mess? Please tell me cause I'm sick of thinking Yeah, I'm sick of reaching out for the truth And living life as a fool Dun, 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 dun